Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch, and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo, saucy. Zaxby's. We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Show, episode 113. On today's show, we talk about ancient beer, Stonehenge bluestones, and an ancient Chinese city. Let's dig a little deeper. All right, welcome to the show, everybody. I'm here with Rachel. Hello. And we are bringing you three news stories that are pretty much have literally nothing to do with each other other than <laughs> that they're old and deal with old things. Yeah, they're pretty much spread out across the entire world. Yeah. So when you do that, of course, you start with beer. <laughs> Being archaeologist. I, I think I need a beer right now. I know, right? <laughs> so let's talk about it. This first article is about an ancient beer factory in Egypt. Yeah. So it's kind of the oldest known beer factory, at least in the ancient Egypt area. They found it in the Abydos, which is an ancient burial ground located in the desert west of the Nile River, south of Cairo. So that's sort of your your setting of the area. And they call it a 5,000-year-old brewery, so around 3,000 BC, mm-hmm. which has some interesting parallels with some other stuff we're going to talk about today. But that being said, 5,000 years ago, brewery in ancient Europe. You know, whenever we talk about these articles, I want to bring up the... I guess the way that we see the articles as archaeologists versus the way that sometimes they're written and the journalists, you know, pull these from somewhere, usually from some other article that was written. So it's like third, fourth, fifth hand knowledge. But Mm -hmm. that being said, a lot of times there's there's the way that this stuff is presented is not the entire story and it could be misconstrued. And two comments that I took out of here were uh, used in royal burial rituals for early kings of Egypt and also previous excavations found evidence that beer was used during sacrificial rites. Okay, but that doesn't mean that the 5,900 gallons of beer they could brew at one time at this one ancient brewery, and just let that number sink in for a second, I mean, that's like spring break in (laughs) Fort Lauderdale. So anyway, that sheer amount of beer is probably... If you just know beer, not just going to be used for sacrifices and rituals. Yeah, I think it's pretty typical in the media for them to grab on to flashy buzzwords like sacrifice and ritual and make it seem like the focus of the archaeological site was beer production for those purposes. But Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that, I mean, yeah, with that many gallons, that the only thing that you can conclude is that the general population was also drinking it. Now, maybe it was just holidays or times when... I mean, come on, it's beer. We I know. know that's not true, right? <laughs> right? People drank beer all the time. It, yeah. it probably wasn't a secret how to make it. It wasn't hard to make it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's probably hard to make good beer, but it probably wasn't hard to make bad beer. They didn't have probably like airtight, pressure-sealed fermentation devices like we have today. I'd be real surprised about that. Right. But a, a, an example that we can use from today that a lot of people listening to this podcast probably are familiar with, if not practice themselves, is Catholicism. Every time you go to Catholic church on Sunday, you go up there and you take a sip of wine. Now it's been magically turned into the blood of Jesus, but it's (laughs) a sip of wine. And I don't know when this practice started, but they probably chose wine back in the day when they were doing this ritual because water would give them dysentery in whatever town they were in. But (laughs) So wine was chosen, and but that's an example of how a common alcoholic drink, if we were looking at this 10,000 years into the future, and all we had was a Catholic church as our, as our first thing we excavated from this ancient society, we might conclude that they fermented grapes into this drink for ritual practices. Right, like specifically <laughs> for drinking one time a week at a... Right. 
at a ceremony, <laughs> really. Yeah. When right? in, when but, in reality, most of the people there were probably drunk from the night before from wine. <laughs> so uh, clearly, you've never been to Catholic mass. Oh yeah, so, I guess so. Well, it only makes sense that we would draw that conclusion potentially, but we have to realize that there's still people involved. Yeah. There's still people and people 5,000 years ago. I can't imagine they were that much different than people today. And they probably finished up a long, hard day of work. And all they wanted to do was go home and relax around the fire with a nice frothy beer. Mm -hmm. Or if you're me, glass of wine. Did they have wine back then? I don't even know. I'm not sure what the wine history is, but I don't either, but I would imagine that wine is also pretty old. Beer is the oldest of yeah. the fermented drinks. Or yeah. really kind of a mead beer kind of thing. But, right. But I don't know about wine. But that being said, I mean, fruit has been gathered for long periods of time. And this stuff kind of happens when somebody leaves a whole bunch of fruit in a container. Fermentation. Yeah. It's and it just thing. ferments. And somebody's like, oh, that doesn't seem too bad. Let me try it. <laughs> so yeah. and then they try to replicate it. And then they just perfect the process through time. Yeah. Because I'm thinking they probably didn't have grapes so much in ancient Egypt, but <laughs> probably not. They probably had other kinds of fruit. So yeah. I'm, sure they, they I'm sure they made some other kind of, you know, alcoholic drinks. That'd be a good question too, is as far as wine goes, well, we call like fruit wines wine now, but mm-hmm. what is the real definition of wine? Is mm. it just fermented fruit? Yeah. Don't know. Is that really all, all fermented fruit is wine because fermented honey is mead, right? Fermented barley and grains or grain related materials is beer. Yeah. So I guess all fermented fruit is wine. I don't and fermented know. rice, sake. <laughs> 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 so and now this site, five thousand years old, they're brewing five hundred five thousand nine hundred gallons of beer at a time in this site, according to evidence. I don't know how we know that they're doing it all simultaneously, but I guess if it's all just sitting there, maybe they are. Well it says that they found Eight huge units. Each one is mm. 65 feet long, eight feet wide, and right. each one included approximately 40 pottery basins, which were right. that's where they would mix the grains in the water, heat them up, and then eventually, you know, it turns into beer, whatever that chemical process how is. Do that happens. Were, how do they know they were used at the same time and not just like discontinued because of one reason yeah. and then made another one? Yeah. Or maybe yeah. they like cycled them. Based on know. location or whatever. So I, I can't imagine they would have that much at once. But Well, my point with saying the, the quantity anyway uh, and the fact that this was 5,000 years ago means that they didn't invent this 5,000 years ago. Let's just give a few beer facts that I just kind of pulled out to round out this article a little bit. But first, the word beer. I, I don't know what the ancient Egyptians called it, but they didn't call it beer. <laughs> and the word beer is, of course, from Old English, like all words that we have that mm-hmm. we speak in English today. And it was from, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's B-E-O-R, and the E's got a line over the top of it. So it probably sounds a lot like beer probably. or Bior or something like that. And it really... Yeah. I know, yeah. And it really <laughs> comes from the, the Germanic areas. So the Germans definitely invented beer. And that makes sense. They would be proud of that. <laughs> I did hear that the early, or I read that the early beers were actually not barley based either. They were more of a cider or mead, mm. uh, but they still basically called it the same thing and yeah. it developed into what we know today. The earliest evidence of fermentation at an archaeological site is 13,000 years ago in Natufian caves near Haifa, Israel. I've been to Haifa. When I was in the Navy, and I didn't have any 13,000-year-old fermented products, but... Oh, guess yeah. we need to go back, because that right? seems like something you missed out on. I know. So, but if there... Again, you got to look at the evidence here. If there's evidence... So, evidence of fermentation doesn't necessarily mean evidence of purposeful fermentation, like we just mentioned. Right. You know, maybe they just happened to find a cave that had some old fruit jars in it, you know, mm-hmm. clay fruit jars or something, and, and they... Uh, They fermented. Who knows? I don't know if it was on purpose or not. We always have to assume also in the archaeological record that what you find was not an accident. What you find is on purpose and it wasn't an outlier. Mm -hmm. You know, we do find outliers, but we can't assume it's an outlier because we're finding a needle in a haystack. But with fermentation, though, it can happen so easily by accident. I feel like you would need to have something else proving that it was done on purpose. Like this beer factory in Egypt, obviously, like that's some big production going on there. That's all on purpose. But when you just find a couple pots in a cave, like how can you say that's on purpose? 
Yeah, and this was just a brief mention, so I didn't really do the deep dive on it. Are yeah. there many caves in Israel with evidence of fermentation? Is it does it span a big period of time? I mean, what's the what's the story there? Yeah. And furthermore, is thirteen thousand years the limit of these chemicals we're able to detect? Do they mm. do they degrade too far in that environment post thirteen thousand years that we can't detect it? But really, they were fermenting stuff at twenty thousand years. It's just undetectable now. Right. So there's a lot of questions related. I mean, these are questions that have answers too. Like I'm not posing yeah yeah th- things that nobody knows the answers to. Right. We just don't know the answer to it. So yeah, I would love to think that like Neanderthals were like coming in up. from the hunt and like chugging I mean, some beers that. That seems right. <laughs> I mean, you're out spearing mastodons. You need a beer after that. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah. So, in uh, I always forget where this is at. I think it's in Turkey, but I'm not really sure. The earliest evidence of what we would call beer or fermented grain type things was from a really famous site called Gobekli Tepe. And if you look in the notes, it's I don't know if I'll have it in the notes or not, but if you're trying to find it, G O B E K L I, and then Tepe is T E P E, and in whatever language that in, that just basically means hill, uh, the Tepe part, because there's lots of Tepe's in that area, and mm-hmm. I think it's I think it's Turkey, but don't hold me to that. I just can't remember where Gobekli Tepe was found, but there's been tons of research on that, and lots of cool things found at Gobekli Tepe. But the date of this pre-pottery Neolithic stuff, and Rachel confirmed it's Turkey, is 8500 to 5500 B C. So that's you know, over ten thousand years ago, they were brewing beer. Yeah. At this at this site. Yeah. So, Beer's yeah. a thing. There you go. Humans love it. So, Gobekli Tepe was some of the earliest stuff of beer brewed from grains. The earliest evidence, but the earliest evidence of beer brewed from barley, which is what most people know, and a lot of the beers that we drink today are are largely barley based is from Western Iran around 3,500 to 3,100 BC. So still over 5,000 years ago in Western Iran. So it sounds like the people in Iran used to be way more fun than they are today. Ooh, burn. I know. I'm kind of an sure Iran that, burn. I'm not sure that the people of Iran really deserved <laughs> that burn right there. I mean, they're pretty serious over <laughs> Good there. Good God. Let's just say that. <laughs> anyway, this is pretty cool. And, you know, obviously we need more evidence of, of things like this to just keep on fleshing out the evidence that we have. And I don't know. I think it's really neat to get these little insights into daily life because I don't I don't take away the excavation and ritual use of this. Sure. Yeah, great. It was used for that. Who cares, right? Mm-hmm. I'm happy to know that beer was flowing through the streets of Egyptian cities <laughs> 5,000 years ago. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's always been my favorite part about archaeological excavations and it's often the thing that the media likes to gloss over but it's just learning what everyday life was like for people because that's almost more interesting to me than yeah. than what was happening in the tombs or the the rituals or whatever because that stuff was it was a one-off and sure it spoke to the greater civilization and what they were capable of and what kind of structure they had Mm -hmm. but it's just not the most interesting part of it to me yeah and you can look at the other stuff that comes along with beer because one of the reasons why alcohol in general across many historical societies pre-industrialized societies which this obviously certainly was is because water was toxic you know, a lot of times water yeah. was polluted and water was hard to get in a clean way. It still yeah. is in lots of Africa. Yeah. There are clean clean water drinking projects still to today trying to get people clean drinking water that they don't have to walk 10 miles for just to bring back and drink mm-hmm. and then do it every single day. That's yeah. a, It's a really hard thing. And, you know, a lot of people in Egypt, because of where it's situated geographically, lived along the Nile. But, you know, how much of the Nile could you just go over and sip out of, right? Yeah. And not and not get sick. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't really know, but probably not a lot of it. And especially inside the cities, any sort of water table or something like that would have been would have been really hard to keep clean. So the fermentation process of whatever you're drinking helps to kill a lot of that. Right. So it, it was just healthier to drink. Yeah, that actually brings me to another question just real quickly before we wrap up here is I wonder what the alcohol content was like in these beers because oh, yeah. if it is They didn't regulate it. Well, no, of course not. <laughs> but they also needed to like function and if if this is this liquid was sort of a water replacement almost because the water was not drinkable and we're making assumptions here obviously, but if the water is not drinkable and this is a water replacement, you have to imagine that the alcohol level would be pretty low so that people could drink it and still function in their daily lives. 
Maybe? I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. They made a massive building-sized human-animal sphinx man. So it's like, go home, Egypt. You're drunk, right? <laughs> but no, I see, what you're, I see what you're saying, though, because, yeah, I mean, it couldn't have been super high in alcohol content right. if, if a lot of people were drinking it pretty consistently for water, basic, for basically for yeah. you know, moisture in their bodies. Um, Really, but, articles like this just bring up bigger questions for me yeah. because I want to know more about the alcohol itself and more about the public consumption of it and what what it looked like on a day to day basis. So, well, and not only that, but did they have a concept of the potency of the alcohol? Because had they figured out that hey, if we ferment it this long, it's basically yeah. day drinking, and if we ferment it this long, it's party time, <laughs> right? So, so we, do we have like a, a scale from day drinking <laughs> to, party to time. like? like spring break yeah 2001 yeah exactly <laughs> exactly so and then, and then of course you can look at all the other questions that come along with it because alcohol is a very two things in our society today one it's very destructive to some families because people over overdo it which right. i'm sure happened back then too and two it's it's very social mm-hmm. so it it brings people together in a way that you know but that that being said i don't know if every household had a you know, a still uh, in the back. Well, that's for distilling. That's, that's for distilling. Yeah, but, but, like, but were they brewing were beer they... in the back of the house? Yeah. You know, just for just for individual consumption, because a lot of people have gardens and things like that. Yeah. Would they have also had something like that? Or are they going down to the local tavern? Now, in Pompeii, we know that they had bars and brothels and things right. like that where people would consume these things. But, but this going is back much further. Yeah, this is much earlier than that. So it does. But still a city. Yet another question comes out of an article like this. Yeah. Like, what did they have? How were they consuming the beer? Did right. they have bars? Was it a home type of situation? I mean, this, the the society was complex enough that they had this large area to produce beer and only to produce beer. So right. it, just, it just brings up more questions on how it was being consumed. All right. Well, we're going to go from beer. And in the next segment, we're going to talk about the Stonehenge Blue Stones, which are neither blue nor from Stonehenge. Back in a minute. <laughs> Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z E N C A S T R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on, and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R dot com and use the code T-A-S. Back to school savings are officially in session at Tanger Outlets. Shop the latest school styles with an extra 25% off during Tanger Style, our biggest sale of the season, now through August 25th. Plan your trip at Tanger dot com. People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. The hiring process can be slow and overwhelming. Simplify hiring with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. That's Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back to episode 113 of the Archaeology Show. And in segment two here, we are going to talk about Stonehenge and the bluestones that make up Stonehenge, where they are originally from. Wait, what's a bluestone? What? <laughs> <laughs> well, bluestone is a British term meaning foreign or not from around here. It's not a geological term, but it's one of convenience to just sort of describe these stones that popped up on the landscape, so yeah. to speak. And, and I didn't look up the origin of using the word blue to mean foreign, and I don't know if it 
maybe some of our British listeners can tell us exactly what this means and where it comes from. I, I mean, I know about all the Cockney rhyming slang and all that stuff. I don't know if this is coming from that or not, but is blue being used to describe something foreign or foreign materials or foreign things like that a common thing? And how long has that been around? I don't know. It might just be a linguistics thing, too, because the way I saw it spelled was B L U. No E on the end of it. S-T-O-N-E. Oh. So it could be that the B-L-U is some kind of Latin or, I don't know, some sort of well root, language root that we're not, we don't know because <laughs> we're not linguistic. I mean, maybe because the article we're reading is from Cambridge University Press online in the, I believe, the journal Antiquity. And they're using bluestone as one word, B-L-U-E-S-T-O-N-E. Oh, and they did have an E in it. Yeah. Okay, so then I saw it without an E. That it's article has it with one. So entirely possible, yeah. Actually, who really knows? Before we really get to the article and where these bluestones came from, let's just set the stage with Stonehenge a little bit, because I know we have a big U.S. audience, and like you, I probably didn't know a whole lot about Stonehenge. I mean, Stonehenge seems like something everybody knows the word Stonehenge. It's mm-hmm. like Nike or Starbucks, right? Like everybody yeah. knows the word Stonehenge. And you can visualize it, right? Right. Like big old tall stones. Well, exactly. Yep. Every, everybody knows what it looks like, but yeah. there are definitely some things when you get down into the finer details that I didn't really think about too much because I've never really paid attention to it. But just to set the stage... Stonehenge is in southern England. It's on what's called the Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, England. And uh, I guess that's all kind of south central England when you when you look at the map. And the outer ring of stones, the big ones that you see on every single picture of Stonehenge, those are called the Sarsen Standing Stones. They're about 13 feet high, 7 feet wide, and 25 tons each. Jeez. That's... <laughs> Like, our RV weighs about half of that. Yeah. Half of that. That's, our entire home. That is many tons. <laughs> <laughs> that is all the tons. All the tons. All the tons. <laughs> and uh, so this is not going to be a conversation about how they constructed Stonehenge 5,000 years ago, because that's wackiness. But uh, we're just going to talk about what it looks like real quick so we can have this conversation. The tops of those stones, they're called lintels. That's just a common architectural term. Yeah. Uh, it combines two things, like the top of a... Doorway Door is called a lintel, yeah. right? So, but the the connecting horizontal stones are called uh, lintels. I don't know if you guys can see my hands, but that's what I'm <laughs> that's what I'm doing here. And then it's uh, great to get the visuals when you're like just sitting right across from me, like me. I'm like lintel, right? Well, and and as a side <laughs> note, check out our Archaeology Podcast Network YouTube channel because our normal recording thing has now has video inherently for our remote broadcast so we're going to start recording a lot of stuff in video however with Rachel and I sitting across from each other video is actually much more difficult in person because we got to get all of the GoPros and the editing and blah 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 we'll figure it out anyway yep. if you want to see video of most of our shows head over to the uh, YouTube channel for yeah, our then product. you can see us waving our hands around like crazy people I'm just saying it adds a lot to the conversation <laughs> it totally does so <laughs> anyway so you got the outside Saracen stones and then you've got the inside ring which is the smaller blue stones and inside those is a third set of stones, not a ring really, but it's a, they're called the Trilithons. I had to look at that. They're called the Trilithons, and they're just bulky Saracens joined by one lintel. So there was oh. probably more to that back in the day. Mm-hmm. I think I've seen reconstructions of what they thought Stonehenge looked like. Obviously a complete circle with lintels all the way around, and then the inner row, and then the almost like an altar in the middle kind of thing. So that's basically what Stonehenge looks like. Now the blue stones were in again that sort of inner ring just inside the sarsens were constructed during the third phase of construction i actually don't know how many phases total there were but they're calling it the third phase of construction around 2300 bc and that's kind of a crazy thing right there to think about because the likely construction of stonehenge from available evidence which it's really hard to figure this stuff out, right? Because right. we might we there's artifacts all over the place. They've done uh, different times types of analytics on the soil and all sorts of stuff around there. But stone, I mean, the stone is, you know, hundreds of millions of years old. Right. <laughs> I mean, so yeah, you can't date the stone, but <laughs> right. you gotta hope. Well, that you, you can, f- but it doesn't tell you anything about construction. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, you gotta hope that there's artifacts around it. Yeah. That give it context, which may or may not happen. Right. But if these dates are even partially right. 3000 BC, that's 5,021 years ago, but exactly 5,021 years ago, they started constructing this. I'm just kidding. It's not exact, but 
<laughs> so the range is 3,000 to 2,000 with current thinking and available evidence. And again, I don't know what that's based on. It's probably a little bit historical for the people they know lived in the area and also all those other things. So the third phase of construction, uh, according to the available evidence, was around 2300 BC, which is 700 years after the construction likely started. So my first question, again, this is not a necessarily a podcast about all of Stonehenge, and I'm sure some people know this. Uh, in fact, I know some people know this, but I don't really understand because uh, I didn't look into it. Like, what was constructed first? Did they start in and move out, or did they start with the big stones and and move in? Which you think would have been really hard to construct the inner ring if the outer ring was already there? Right. I'm not really sure about that, but it must have be it must be at least partially true because this is the third phase of construction, putting these blue stones in. So you know, maybe the people that put in the blue stones knocked over the other stones. <laughs> well, that's what, yeah, that's what I'm wondering. I don't know. I guess I just don't know enough about the history of Stonehenge. Right, right. But either way, it doesn't matter. The The third phase, this blue, the blue stones are the ones that we're interested right. in right now. So why are these called blue stones? Because they're foreign to the British. But why are they foreign? Where did they come from? Well, it's been commonly thought that they came from Wales. I mean, that's been yeah. knowledge for a long time. Yeah, I think I think I read like five years ago is yeah. when, uh, 2015-ish is when they sort of established that, yes, these stones definitely came from Wales. They were dragged across the landscape to, to where they sit now in England. Or brought there by aliens. One of those two things. <laughs> So yes. let's not perpetuate that myth. <laughs> right, right. So one of the cool things that I did not expect when seeing this article, which is one of the reasons, aside from Stonehenge, just everybody loves Stonehenge. But aside from that, I think one of the things that really brought this into the current news cycle is because Merlin the Magician is mentioned in a historical context. Oh, really? Yeah, which is what I thought was really cool. It's just the intro to the article from Cambridge Uni- University Press we're putting on here. It's basically referring to Geoffrey of Monmouth, mm, uh, who yeah. around AD 1136, in a text called History of the Kings of Britain, described how the monument was built using stones from the Giant's Dance Stone Circle in Ireland. And apparently... That stone circle was dismantled by Merlin, like the legit <laughs> Merlin the Magician that everyone knows and loves, and shipped, no big deal, let's just ship, you know, multi-ton stones across <laughs> the landscape, but shipped to Amesbury on Salisbury Plain by a force of 15,000 men who had defeated the Irish, captured the stones. Mm-hmm. Uh, according to the legend, uh, Stonehenge was built to commemorate the death of Britons who were treacherously killed by Saxons during peace talks at Amesbury, and Merlin wanted the stones of the giant's dance for their magical healing properties. Mm-hmm. But of course, all of that is complete fiction. Right. Yeah. I mean, Merlin either A, didn't exist, but definitely wasn't a magician. Right. Yeah, so there's that. Wait, magic's not real? Uh, well, see our episode... <laughs> On, <laughs> on Harry Potter, <laughs> on the magic of Harry Potter, the archaeology of Harry Potter. Uh, so, in some universes, magic is real, right? But yeah, so with this legend, uh, the the parts of this that are, of course, not true is the Saxons did not arrive in prehistory, but it says only about seven hundred years before um, Geoffrey of Monmouth's own time. But I think to a person like that, seven hundred years ago would have been prehistory, so they would have discussed it that way. Yeah. And, and the stones did not come from Ireland. Like, none of the stones come from Ireland. We know that conclusively. So, who knows where that story came from. But the fact that the stones were drugged there by a group of people and taken from another stone circle, not quarried, because pr- prior to this, they thought that they were they knew the quarry location in yeah. Wales. And you know what? I don't think the article goes into this, but the quarry location might still be right. Who knows? Mm-hmm. It's just they were actually quarried and made into this other stone circle in a place in Wales called Wanmon. Yes. Uh, W-A-U-N-M-A-W-N. And what I know of the Welsh language, which is literally nothing, I'm probably <laughs> pronouncing that very badly. Yeah. So yeah, don't don't take our pronunciation. Phonetically, true. <laughs> yeah, phonetically, it's Wanmon. And uh, kind of a cool place. I think it's in like a national park right now. And uh, it's a it's a pretty neat little... Uh, pretty neat little area, but I would really love to visit. But apparently the circle they think used to be there. Yeah. They found the location of it, and then they were moved to Stonehenge at some point for who knows what reasons. Yeah, I think that's that's what grabbed my interest about this article, is that I just would love to know the mindset of a group of people who spent all the time and effort to quarry these stones in Wales, and then to place them in the ground in a circle, similar probably to what Stonehenge looks like now, in Wales. And then... 
to take those stones and then move them over into England? Like, like what was the why? Why? I just want to know why. Was it like a leader that? Because you always think a, a super strong leader is the kind of person who can mobilize people to to do monumental architecture, basically like this. Mm-hmm. Was it a, a leader who was like? No, I don't want him here. I want to move him over there. Or maybe like there was a battle and somebody won and the other lost and the one that the victor was like, okay, now this is the seat of power over here. I don't know. I don't know. But I would love to know why, why this move happened. Well, the cool thing is apparently we've known about the stone circle at Juan Mon for quite some time. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's not invisible. It's on a big wide open plain with no vegetation on it. Great. And there's other stones still there. Yeah. So not only did they steal the stones from this circle, but they didn't take them all. Yeah. There's there's no scale in this photo. Bad archaeologists. Um, (laughs) I think it's like a drone shot, though, so it's hard to say. I can't really tell how big they are. Um, That's the only thing I'm trying to kind of figure out. Yeah. But anyway, I think it's cool that it's still there, and they're just kind of... They're just kind of putting it together that these were likely quarried from the same location, and then these stones here were not taken from the quarry. They were taken from this circle and brought to Stonehenge, which which that that knowledge in itself says something about these stones. You know, did they really think that these stones had some magical or spiritual properties, which is why they wanted to imbue the Stonehenge monument with these properties by taking yeah. from the stone circle? Or did they just not want to quarry their own stones and said, hey, let's take these. Nobody's watching them. Yeah, that is actually a really good point. I was I was thinking about it happening in the same time period, but it actually seems like the Juan Mon circle is earlier, like three 3,600 to 3,000 mm-hmm. BC. So, and then Stonehenge, of course, the construction begins... 3,000 to 2,000 BCE. So, I mean, we're yeah. throwing these numbers around like they're nothing, but that stone circle stood for a millennia. Before somebody... Before somebody ripped off the stones. Yeah, probably true. took it. Probably took years to drag them to where they're at now. Yeah, yeah. You know, that wasn't done in a season. Even That's with 15,000 people, it was not done quickly. You know what it kind of reminds me of? Mm. It's sort of like how the original London Bridge was dismantled oh. and moved. Yeah. Right? Isn't it... Where is it now? It's in... um. It's in uh, uh, like, Palm Springs, California. Yeah. I think. Or no, Lake Havasu. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of the same idea, actually, now that I think about it, because here's this thing that's a thousand years old and it's obviously really important, but they have no use for it where it currently is. So the effort was made to move it across an ocean in this case, you know, with modern technology that was not as difficult as it would have been 5,000 years ago. But anyway. Same idea, I guess. So maybe it was some sort of reverence for this circle in Wales that caused them, um, you know, a thousand years later, 800 years later, whatever it was, to go to the effort to move it to this new location in England. So maybe it was something like that. Who knows? But it is interesting, the parallel, because I think there's a bit of a history of of modern people moving older ancient monuments somewhere else. Man, and I thought you were going to say Battlestar Galactica, because <laughs> all this has happened before. Okay, can we not talk about the last episode of that show? Because, come on. I know, come on. <laughs> they, it's like, ancient, ruined the whole show. It's ancient human anyway. history, clearly. <laughs> oh, my God. So, all right, well, I don't want to talk too much more about Stonehenge, because there is so much information out there, and we know very little of it, but I just thought it was cool that the stone's original location not being, well... Original, original would be the quarry, but where they were drugged from between there and Stonehenge is uh, is likely this location. And I thought that was a pretty neat, uh, pretty neat thing and a pretty neat yeah. thing culturally for the area, too. Like, was there nobody culturally influenced by the, the circle at Juan Mon anymore to defend that? Or yeah. was it just they didn't have enough people to it and, and, and it was just, you know, they just came in and took them? Yeah. So Interesting. Interesting to speculate for sure why that would have happened. All right. Well, we are going to jump from here over to China uh, at a little more a little more recent time, but the, not that much more in the next segment. Back in a minute. You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun T-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our T Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. 
and the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zach's Rewards app. Woo, saucy! Zaxby's. People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. The hiring process can be slow and overwhelming. Simplify hiring with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. That's Indeed.com slash P-O-D-K-A-T-Z 12. Terms and conditions apply. All right, welcome back to episode 113 of the Archaeology Show, another news edition. And for this one, we're headed all the way to China. Yeah, so this article really grabbed my attention because it is the excavations at... Oh boy, help me here. <laughs> We're going to butcher a lot of Chinese right now. Yeah, we are. Um, excavations at Xinjiang, the capital of the Qing Dynasty. I'm, I'm going to just assume that that is as close as... An American can get to saying Chinese words. <laughs> Chin, I think, is Q U I N. Oh, really? Chin? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. X is a Z, I think, and Q is a Ch sound, but I'm not really sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, the reason this is interesting is because they have known that the city is there for a very long time. It's actually right next to the modern day city of Xinjiang, but nobody had really excavated it. So. They've been doing these excavations there for the past few years, and they're just getting a bigger picture of what society in this ancient Chinese city was like. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool because it seems like the excavation history here is pretty extensive and going back all the way to the, the 1950s. And it kind of makes me wonder about the... I don't know, the push for Chinese excavation, like what are the focuses? Does somebody grow up and think, I want to know more about that society? Because there have been pretty well-documented dynasties in China and imperial dynasties and, and pre-imperial dynasties going back uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And that's just a pretty cool thing to think about, mm -hmm. I think, because this you know Chinese society is so old. Yeah, and this city in this dynasty specifically dates to the early part of the millennia, somewhere in the 200-ish range. And, well, that's BC. I'm um, sorry, yes, BC. Yeah. It's it's basically the first imperial dynasty, like consolidated Chinese imperial dynasty. And that's part of what the importance of the Qin dynasty is, is that they mm -hmm. brought it together. Now, it wasn't a long-lasting dynasty. It, it only lasted for 15 years before... The, before they collapsed for whatever reason. so, But it did start this pattern of of ruling imperial dynasties that would mm -hmm. pop up and, and control the Chinese mainland over the years. Yeah, it also makes me wonder, cause just from reading this article, it sounds like you know, they're, they've are they been actively looking for this one. They knew about it. They've been actively looking mm -hmm. for it. Um, they're still, right at the end of the article, they still say they're still looking for the city walls, implying that most cities had walls. Yeah. And the writer of the article was basically saying, I'm, I'm kind of holding out that, that this city had no walls and it was open to everyone, but that's probably not true. <laughs> probably <laughs> not. Which is curious to me that, I mean, it tells you a lot about how early Chinese society and probably lots of them, uh, lots of early societies worked was basically on dominance, right? So when a dynasty would... And one dynasty would end and another one would pick up, it's pretty clear that they didn't do it in the same location, which means that these palaces and, and towns were probably ransacked and, and mm -hmm. completely destroyed. Everybody was probably either killed or moved off to somewhere else. Yep. And then wherever the new dynasty is taking place, that's where it's at. Yeah. So it kind of makes you wonder, like, what was China 2,200 years ago? Was it a, a collection of, you know, warring factions? Did they really rule over the whole land? Or did they just rule long enough 
to to hold power before somebody else came and took him down. Yeah, it kind of sounds like it was a little bit sort of like the Roman Empire was towards the end where it was very dispersed and I think there was a lot of fighting along the edges and the boundaries and in the areas away from Rome. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that China being such a large area was very similar in that, yeah, it was super strong wherever they established their capital at. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, it was, there was probably more fighting and and people weren't as under the thumb of the imperial rulers Mm -hmm. as As you might think when you look at a map and see these giant lines around the places that were part of the territory. Yeah, I always want to know more about China. Uh, When I did the ARC 365 podcast, which was a podcast a day for about a year and a half, Mm -hmm. I did actually quite a few episodes. They're all, you know, five to 15 minutes long. Check it out on arcpodnet.com slash arc365 if you want to know more. But I did uh, quite a few episodes on things in China and mm-hmm. Chinese sites and, and other places like that. And man, there's just so much history there. And I, I want to talk, I want to talk real quick about the history of people there, because if you're listening to this and you're sitting in the United States, or even if you're in, you know, the UK or Australia, wherever you happen to be, you have a rough idea of how far back human history goes, right? And in Europe, human history goes back much farther than written history, of course, and much farther than what we what we consider like bands and tribes and, and people like that. But over here in the United States, eh, people go back documented about 15,000 years mm-hmm. and, you know, with scant evidence and, and growing evidence, possibly much farther, but still you know, not that much farther compared to other places. So China, just really briefly, there's evidence of early hominids back 2.25 million years ago uh, being on the Chinese mainland, which a lot of people think, you know, if they don't study this, they might just think that all early hominids were still in Africa. Mm -hmm. Uh, But no, 2.25 million years ago, they had reached um, China. And not only that, but Homo erectus, which was one of the more prolific proto Homo sapiens. Uh, you may have heard of Peking man. Mm-hmm. It comes literally from Peking, China. Yep. Um, 680 to 780,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then some of the first Homo sapiens, so clearly defined humans, dating back 125,000 to 80,000 years ago, which is no surprise why a lot of early things that we take for granted in this world, like writing and gunpowder and you know all kinds of other stuff, just developed in China first because they were some of the first collections of you know collaborative working together humans right the last little stat here i have is they have evidence of writing uh, i'm calling it proto writing from seven to nine thousand uh seven thousand thousand bce sorry at about nine thousand years ago i mean that's insane that's crazy and not to compare with other parts of the world because obviously humans were evolving and developing at different rates but I mean, 9,000 years ago here in the U.S., nothing like writing was happening, I mean, right? half like, the country was under an ice sheet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other half was underwater. I know. I just, I love thinking about what was happening in other other places in the world yeah. while something truly special and developmental and pushing the human, human humans forward mm-hmm. was happening in China. China is such an interesting place because I don't know about your college experience, but mine, like, I don't feel like we studied China all that much. No, I don't, just, I don't know hardly anything about China. Yeah, it's just, it's kind of the same with Africa, and I'm sure it's sort of a, that subtle racism that sort of runs through everything yeah. in our country, but well, I don't, it's, it, yeah, I mean, you have to have people who are experts that are willing to teach these things at whatever university you go to. Of course, there's like lots of extenuating circumstances, but I definitely don't feel like even in my anthropology 101 type of classes that I really learned that much about China or Africa. So this story in particular is kind of filling in a little bit of a gap for me since I didn't know anything about the, you know, Chinese prehistory. Yeah. And I know, I know a little bit more about the, uh, the hominid history of of China and Africa only because I pretty closely studied paleoanthropology in my undergrad for a while and really kind of dove into a lot of the books and, and research around that because that's what I thought I wanted to do with my life. Mm-hmm. Still kind of do, but that's another <laughs> story. But uh, yeah, and I think I think part of the reason we didn't learn it that much, just thinking about it, is the just the nature of a undergraduate education that glosses over a lot of stuff. They're yeah. going to focus more on where you're at, unless you take a specific course on African or Chinese prehistory, which good luck finding one of those at most universities. Yeah. 
well, most people would get into studying this if they choose that they want to study this and then they go to a graduate program that has professors that are teaching this where right. they can learn it. Right. You know, so you're not going to just by nature learn a lot about other parts of the world. You'll gloss over it, which is why we don't remember it, but mm-hmm. you're not going to learn a lot about it. Yeah. All right. So part of what makes this site super interesting is that they've sort of been looking for this sort of the city center or the heart of the city for a couple of years now. And they do feel like they have found it. They've uncovered like at least 47 large scale structures spread out over a pretty giant area. And it took them seven years to find that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it just because the area is so big and the city itself was so big. I think it just took a long time to find the the really, truly important places for actually excavating. Also, one line of the article here says two areas of the city were linked by a wooden bridge spanning a river. Does every Chinese city look like the pottery? <laughs> oh, like the like the blue willow pottery with <laughs> yeah. the like arched bridge over yeah. the water. Yeah, with the little Chinese houses in the background and the, yeah. and the what is it like the daughter kind of like fleeing from her she's her father or eloping. something. Yeah, oh, yeah she's yeah. like going to meet her love yeah. in elope or whatever. Yeah. Is this the first instance of that? That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that's the bridge that inspired that type of pottery. Hey, who knows? And just got yeah. passed down for the last 2000 ish right. years. Right. That's totally logical. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they found those structures. They found the ancient city's main street that they're calling Empire Avenue. And yeah, they're just, they're finding imprints of wagon tracks, heavy, heavy traffic and just, just evidence of life, like, like thriving metropolitan life in this city that dates to 221 CE, which is really neat. Yeah, and just listening to some of the construction techniques from 2,200 years ago, uh, one of the houses was built, or one of the buildings, I should say, was built on uh, what they're saying was a huge elevated platform, and a three-story building was constructed on top of that. And so you had this platform and a three-story mm-hmm. building on top of that. And they said on the first floor, there were winding corridors. On the second floor, there were smaller rooms. And on the third floor was the main hall of the palace. So this is one of the palace buildings that they're talking about. Uh-huh. On the third floor. Yeah. I mean, they had the construction techniques to build a sturdy enough building where on the third floor is where like the main hall was. And I, I would say... In, in a lot of definitely later architecture, something like that could be on a higher floor, particularly because you can make your ceilings whatever you want. So you can have this grand hall, but still have other stuff below it. Mm-hmm. But it's just, I don't know why I'm always surprised at what people could do 2,000 years ago, because people were doing amazing <laughs> things 2,000 years yeah. ago. So yeah, seriously, that the, yeah. the architectural knowledge needed to create something like that is pretty insane. Yeah, they're, they're actually describing it as luxurious in some yeah. cases. There's the scale of it, too. So coming back to the archaeology... And I think we're going to have to speculate a little bit here because this article doesn't go super in depth into the actual like archaeological methods or Mm -hmm. whatever. But when you're excavating a three story building, are you seeing the three levels like collapsed onto one another and you're you're trying to like sort through the pieces to put it back together? Or how do you think that went? Well, it had to be that way in this case because they excavated to find all this stuff, yeah. which means they weren't excavating, you know, full buildings under the ground, of course. Yeah, they couldn't have been. it's called a palimpsest, and that's what archaeology always is. It's when you've got multiple layers that are not only on top of each other, but a palimpsest is more of when, you know, some of the materials leached out. We see this in excavating in the Great Basin of the United States because a mm-hmm. lot of the material has leached out from the little bit of water that goes through there and everything's kind of on the same level. Yeah. So you just have to slowly excavate this stuff, try to see exactly what is on top of something else, and then take a look at those individual objects and say, well, in any sort of... It, well, and you're also looking at this through a lens of your own personal experience, whether mm-hmm. that's ancient technology you're already aware of or your own personal biases on how things are built and constructed, but also physics, mm-hmm. right? Like certain things are just not done in, in building construction uh, it, it, prehistorically because they couldn't do it or not prehistorically, but historically, I guess, whatever mm-hmm. you want to look at it. But anyway, so you got to, you got to look at these things individually, these individual pieces, and then just use 
common sense and knowledge to say, well, this one's over the top of this one is over the top of this one. Mm -hmm. And also know that at some point they collapsed. Yeah. Right. And, and maybe some of the material was taken away. Um, was it abandoned? How did it collapse? Was it, was it pulled down in that case? You know, if you've ever seen like a video of a house collapsing or falling over or something like that, it doesn't just drop down like an accordion. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like you're not going to get these nice, even separated, no. perfect levels. And it no, it's not like you can grab way. a string and just pull the thing up and stretch yeah, it back out. Yeah. Which is yeah. how I, I, I've never worked on a site of this size or number of levels. So I guess I'm just trying to figure out like how they would know that the third level was the tallest level and stuff like that. I so. think, I think more than likely because it is China and there's a lot of stuff there, they more than likely have, examples of stuff that are extant that, oh, that, like, so that they, they can idea. still see. Yeah. yeah. Maybe not 2000 years old, mm -hmm. especially like a wooden structure, 2000 years old. But, um, yeah, I, I think that they have enough knowledge, enough writing, enough drawings, enough just ethnographic and historic evidence to know what some of this stuff either looked like or was described as looking like mm -hmm. in order to piece back together what they were seeing. Yeah. But it is a, it is like putting together a pretty crazy puzzle where, not only do you not have all the pieces, but you don't have the box top or know what it looks like. Right. And, <laughs> and some of the pieces are broken. Yeah. Right. They're, they've been destroyed. The little nubs have been broken off. Try to put that puzzle together. Oh my God. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. I know. So it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of architectural knowledge. It takes a lot of historical knowledge of the people in the area mm -hmm. to be able to see what you're looking at and interpret where could that have gone? Right. Where does this fit in the puzzle? Yeah, so, for sure. It's pretty admirable what they're able to do with this and, and the dedication and, and devotion to it. And you got to check out the link from China Daily in, in the show notes here because there's some really cool pictures of uh, some of the finds and, and uh, some pictures of the site as well. Not as many as I would like, but definitely some cool stuff. Yeah. Do any of the pictures show the, the ox bones? Because that was one thing that I read about. I don't see any. So the ox bones was a, it's a massive deposit, 1300 pounds worth of ox bones. And a lot of them are perforated with rectangular holes. So they think that they were using them for like decoration of some sort, mm -hmm. decorative items or, or adornments of some sort. Some were finished, some were unfinished. And the reason it was so cool is because it gave them an idea of how they were creating these things and what the process was for for making them. And that is just like that window into everyday life. Because it sounds like this was not something that was just reserved for the rich and the leaders and whatever. Mm -hmm. Like it was sort of a common adornment, at least for having that many ox bones laying around anyway. And yeah, I just think that that is so neat to get that window into how they created the daily things that were part of a daily, the daily life of the people. Yeah. And speaking of daily life, one of the final things here on the last page of the article is they found what they think was the primary road that went through the city, uh, more than 50 meters wide, which is about 150 feet. Oh, is that the, that the Admiral? Um, uh, yeah, it? something like that. Or Empire um, Road, I think. Yeah. yeah. But it said it had many, many wagon ruts in its center. And they measured them meticulously and found that one of the tracks was uh, 1.35 meters wide. Measuring it was uh, painstaking work, they say here. And they huh. had to... They had to compare the ruts very carefully and pair them one by one because if the ruts are all on top of each other, oh, it's like yeah. looking at rock art sometimes. Can't tell what goes with yeah. what. Yeah. I mean, you had to look at depths and, and probably wheel size and, you know, whatever that was and, and really figure that out. But they said that, you know, finding this network of roads and, and such as a, as a framework for the city really helped give them a picture of what the layout looked like and, and what it was. But I'm just thinking... Could you imagine the people on a 50 meter ride road? <laughs> yeah. Like it must have been just hustling and bustling yeah. with activity at all times. So many people. I never saw anywhere where they said like what they estimate the population of the city to be. But I don't think I saw that either. Given the, the size of it, the structures, the roads, it must have been a really big ancient city for mm -hmm. sure. So yeah, super neat. All right. Well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. And we've got some pretty cool concept episodes coming up of what we're going to try out. So stay tuned for that. And uh, and if you are listening to this and you are an archaeologist and you're working somewhere in the world, doesn't matter where, let's tell our audience about what you're doing. Yeah. So 
contact us, Chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com, or you can look at our regular retort recording, or you can look at our regular recording times on the right hand side of the webpage. If you're not looking on a mobile device, it's on a mobile device, it's down near the bottom somewhere. But if you're just on a website, go to arcpodnet.com forward slash archaeology. And on the right hand side is some text that says schedule an interview. And it says what times we record. It's usually on Friday afternoons every week. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, we're definitely interested in interviewing real people in the field, you know, doing doing the real stuff. There you go. See you next week. Thanks for listening to The Archaeology Show. Feel free to comment and view the show notes on the website at www.archpodnet.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ArcPodNet. You can also find us on the Lyceum app, a podcast app just for educational podcasts. Music for this show is called I Wish You Would Look from the band Sea Hero. Again, thanks for listening and have an awesome day. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV Traveling America, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One with pico and creamy chipotle ranch and the other with bacon and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Taco experts since now. Woo saucy. Zaxby's. Chicken tacos should only be trusted to chicken professionals. That's where we come in. Introducing Zaxby's new chicken finger tacos. One comes with pico de gallo and creamy chipotle ranch. And the other comes with bacon, lettuce, tomato, and avocado ranch. Chicken experts since 1990. Chicken taco experts since now. Order yours today in the Zax Rewards app. Woo saucy! Zaxby's.